Thank you, and uh, welcome all. Uh, we're going to talk about a telco CNF journey from zero to millions. I'm Sharad Trau. I'm a solutions manager at Ericsson, uh, working on delivering end-to-end -end solution architects and, uh, and the delivery of containerized network functions into various operators. Uh, I've been working with cloud for, for, from uh, 2011, uh, initially with OpenStack and VNF world, and now moved into CNF world with Kubernetes. Hi, I'm uh, Abdul Hanan. I'm working at Ericsson for uh, 12 years and uh, delivering uh, primarily core control plane applications for our customers from uh, 2G to 5G and also from uh, purpose built to now cloud native. Let's uh, begin our journey. So, we all know what is a cloud native application, right? So, we are aware, follow a similar principle across the different spectrum. It talks about using loosely coupled services, and these loosely coupled services talk to each other using a you know, well-defined interface and all the benefits that go with it. A telco containerized network function is a little bit different from a typical cloud native application in the sense that in addition to this, uh, the, in addition to the things that the CNA provides, it also needs to cater for certain other important requirements, including uh, high performance, right? A latency, faster packet processing. So we use like SRIOV or DPDK in order to do this faster packet processing, as well as support for multiple networks. Uh, not saying this, all these requirements are required with the very same CNF at the same time. It's going to be a mix and mash of these requirements. And we have different, uh, different areas in which we have CNFs, right? It can be a 5G core CNF, it can be an IMS CNF, or it can be a charging CNF, or it can be a RAN CNF. So based on what kind of subgroup you belong to, you have different requirements that, that you need to cater to in order to do the deployment. And uh, here we have uh, put together some numbers um, for some uh, cloud native deployments in public US operators. Um, and again, uh, all of them together. Uh, so these are 21 million unique subscribers. And similarly, they have 33 million unique IP sessions uh, deployed all across the US on multiple different uh, deployments and also making 60K plus unique API calls. And uh, there happens to be a particular windy city here. Uh, so we have taken numbers from a very uh, a single deployment that was covering uh, uh, this location uh, earlier this summer, where we had uh, around 1.5 million subscribers on the node uh, that externally leads up to uh, 1 million packets per second that it had to uh, process. And this does not include the internal microservices communication. It's just talking to the external network. Um, so taking a step back after that, um, how did we uh, end up with cloud native? So we were living in a very rosy world of uh, purpose-built hardware. Uh, no problems, everything is fine, but uh, we decided to disaggregate, right? So went through the whole VNF transition and uh, somebody decided it's not complex enough. So we are going to do this. Um, well. Regardless, here we are, and uh, the benefits, of course, we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> we already, that decision is already made. Um, some of the challenges, right? Uh, this was discussed earlier in the, I believe, the elephant talk, talk as well. Uh, there's some integration challenges. There are uh, R&D costs uh, involved. Uh, and also uh, performance optimization. The fact that you're going to put anything anywhere, but you need, of course, you need to uh, optimize uh, for what you need. and. At the end of the day, you have to satisfy, at the bottom right, you have to satisfy all the 911 calls. There are around 500,000 made in the US every day. Uh, I think that adds up to 240 million in the whole year, and that's like 80% of them are on the wireless network. Um, that's like one call per adult in the US per year, right? So, and that call has to be made, it cannot be dropped, it has to go through. It has to talk to multiple microservices within CNF, it has to go to other CNFs in your network, and you don't know where it's going, but it has to handle. It, be, it have to be handled, right? It cannot be dropped. So that's the primary requirement, I think the most stringent requirement we have right now. But on the left side, we also have this whole ecosystem of devices that we have to uh, cater to. Um, iPhones, Samsungs, underlying, underlying that, you have Qualcomm, MediaTek, you have now laptops. 
uh, there are drone use cases, so on and so forth, right? And all the devices behave differently. Despite the fact that we have specs and everything, different scenarios, d devices do behave differently, and you have to handle those, uh, do that behavior. We also, different use cases require different requirements. And then also, and then, you know, the taking from the previous slide, we also have the different configurations that people want to uh, deploy in their network. And uh, from the operation perspective, what we are building is not just for North America, it's for globally. The maturity level of the uh, operational tools that the different operators have globally are different. And the application has to work with uh, that as well. So uh, quite a complex picture today, I think, and that we have to work with. And I believe I hand back yeah, to you. Yeah. So when we look at this journey, right? So, uh, so Abdul talk about all the complexity that's involved. But then how do you build a CNF, right? So you have, you have to cater for a PNF, VNF, and then the CNF, right? So you have, typically you use a lift and shift strategy because you've already built a lot of the underlying framework in your, for your different uh, network functions earlier, right? And lift and shift strategy is something typically that uh, is recommended as well. As we increase our maturity into cloud native, that's when the lift and shift goes away and you slowly replace it with purely, you know, using the whole 12 factor thing. Uh, from an infrastructure perspective, right, it's, it's not straightforward in the case that, as you were saying, across the world, you got different data centers, you got, uh, you got data centers at the edge location, which, which may not run more than a few servers, you got, you got data centers with space, maybe a premium, so you need to handle that, and you got very large data centers, for example, in the hyperscalers, where you, know, you have virtually unlimited uh, capacity, right? So you, your application or your CNF should cater for all these different uh, aspects as part of the uh, development process. And then comes the CI-CD part, right? The CI-CD part is, is its own journey. I think that's why they have uh, a separate session on CI-CD here, right? CI-CD is not so easy to integrate when it goes into an operator's world, right? It, the CI-CD part, in, if you split up it, the CI part, the continuous integration, which the development team looks at in terms of testing and the integration, that part is well baked and it's being followed through, but the CD part is still something that is lacking. I just want to add that when we are taking an existing network function, operators typically ask for feature parity off the, off the bat. Like, you know, you're replacing one network function that's working in my network. You're just, all you're doing is making it a containerized function, so I need feature parity and I also need time to market. Um, so those are also considerations that go into uh, application development. And if you're introducing a new function, then of, of course the question is, will it fit in my existing network? Will it fit in my existing environment? So the new has to adapt to the old in a, in a sense as well. Exactly. So now that we have built the CNF, well, how do we take it right into the production? So typically you do the crawl, walk, run kind of thing, right? So you crawl, you crawl by first putting it into your own lab if available, and then getting it, get some basic testing going and some functionality, validate the functionality of the product across, right? Then you take it into an operator's lab where you not only do the basic functionality testing, but more importantly, as do all operators and CSPs, they don't have a single vendor to satisfy one function. You usually have multiple vendors satisfying the functions. So you need to work well with, with your peers in the community as well, right? So that's the that's first step of testing there. Then you need to integrate with various southbound and northbound systems that exist in an operator's environment uh, for FCAPs, right? So for fault monitoring, for alarming, for the ticket, their ticketing system, so on and so forth. Uh, and that, that kind of testing happens in the operator's lab. Now that we have uh, no, not a fully baked good, but good enough that all it needs is a nice crusting on top, we take that and put it into an oven and turn it on to broil and hit it with the load that it can handle, right? This is where you use a lot of simulators uh, because uh, you, don't, you don't necessarily translate real-world E-node-Bs uh, in, in a lab, so you don't put in your entire RAN deployment in a lab. So you use simulators and you hit your CNF with this kind of load, and then you certify that, right? So now, once we are finished through these different labs, we take this baked CNF and put it into a production environment for folks to devour. And that's what happens, right? That's where the numbers come in and it's growing every day. One thing is that not all operators have all these different labs, 
but you have it uh, may not be physical, but it is there from a functionality or a uh, conceptual uh, perspective. Right? That is always available. Uh, then, oh, all right, people, okay, challenges, yes. Yeah. So once you're done, uh, I think that throughout the whole journey, like even when you're um, doing all the validation, you're kind of not really validating the CNF, you're validating the whole solution from top to bottom, left to right. As Sharath was saying, you have uh, different vendors as well involved, and they're also plugging into your network function, you are integrating with them, you are to doing all the signaling, the million packets you're sending, uh, your control flow function is sending to the gateway, and then so on and so forth, your policy charging, everything is involved. So at the end of the day, you are validating um, the entire solution, which means you do have to talk to a lot of people. And uh, there are a spectrum of expectations that you have to satisfy. Uh, Especially like the closer you get to your net own network function, the more the expectations are you know going to be uh, you will have to handle and you have to manage. If policy is sitting far away from you, then maybe not really big a problem. But uh, if you're sitting on the cloud, the uh, application folks have different expectations. The legacy, the, the folks who have been dealing with the cloud, they have different expectations. They have different ways of working. They have when you're troubleshooting with them, uh, different approaches, different you know ways of looking at the problem. So. And all of that, of course, is coming off from their, uh, from their experience, right? Everybody has their own vast experience where they're coming from. And now, in some cases, it does end up colliding. Uh, there are also expectations for people from, from, again, from parity perspective, that this CNF will behave just like my VNF that's been in the system for five years. Uh, no, right? It's, it's changing. The things are changing. The way it works is now different. So um, that was one, I think, I think the most important challenge at the end of the day uh, is working with uh, the existing pre-existing conditions of that, that you know, expectations that folks have. Um, secondly, as, as Charles was mentioning, that different operators or different whoever wants to deploy, uh, you know, even, even private networks, they will have their own different configurations. Some people will be, some operators will be able to buy 100 computers to throw at it. Some will only have a, you know, the switch already exists. It physically exists. It can only take this much power. It can only handle one more rack. That's it. You're, you're only getting a rack worth of computers. You're not getting anything else. So how do I minimize the footprint? Uh, some are willing to put their uh, applications in the public cloud. So you have all these different kind of um, configurations, and I actually even came out of use case that I want to deploy an app, and I want to deploy a backup app, but it will be sitting in its own unique box in cloud. That is it's only for this application. There's no sharing there. So you have these different styles that people want to deploy with, um, so you have to deal with them as well. And that does become a, I think, a very interesting challenge. Uh, the, the third one about it, Protocol mix, that's more of a kind of an FYI. Uh, I think telcos, we are kind of used to the UDP protocol because our GTP v2 is the very famous you know, uh, control plane protocol that runs over UDP. Uh, in our 5G, since they're moving to service-based, HTTP, they're relying on TCP transport, and that kind of sometimes catches people off guard. Like, I'm used to my power automatically, you know, uh, UDP, fire and forget. I'll, I'll load balance, but then TCP is like a stream, and it's a client server, and it's stuck there, it's not moving. Why is it not moving? Why is my why is all the packets going on this stream all the time? I upgraded, you know, my one of my server parts restarted. Why is it not establishing any new connections? Well, it's a server part. It's not, <laughs> the clients have to establish, but the clients moved already to somewhere else. So there are some different behaviors. Again, nothing uh, new here, but you know, kind of gets people that I've seen uh, off guard that oh, we're using TCP and the behavior is now different and uh, something we have to deal with. So. And, and then comes the, so if you look at it, it's people, process, tools, technology, right? So you, you have to, all, you always have challenges in processes. And the big challenge we are facing right now in process is the fact that they have adopted an application development strategy in doing a lift and shift approach of the processes as well. So they have lifted the exact process that they follow for a virtual world into a containerous world. They expect this part should be running on this node, come what may. And that never happens. And their systems, their backend systems, are built just for that purpose. Their backend system are also expecting this part, this part of your CNF runs on this node throughout its life cycle. And the, the challenge that we have with that is that 
Kubernetes will never allow you to do that once a node reboots, it finds the best possible location, it keeps on moving the parts around, right? So that's where we have to cater to that process. Additionally, right, so we, the, the processes are still in kind of a journey towards maturity, uh, if we can use that acronym again, is that it, the, they are not yet so mature to understand how cloud native should work. They are getting there, but they're still stuck. So when they even talk to you, they don't talk to you using cloud native terminology, they talk to you using like your PNF terminology. And that's, that's because they are also handling some of, the, uh, some of the applications on the PNF side, on the VNF side, and on the CNF side, right? So that, that part is uh, very challenging in terms of the processes that we are involved because we need to adhere to their uh, requirements. Then the final thing comes with upgrade and the fatigue that it brings. Typically in uh, CSPs and operators, you can't just go and operate willy-nilly, right? You need to take a maintenance window, you need to ensure traffic is offloaded, uh, there's no impact to subscribers so that you, know, you don't get hit with the 911 call outage or, and get fined by the FTC, uh, kinds of things. So they are very careful, uh, all operators are very careful when it comes to doing upgrades. And what it does is that it slows down the process of upgrade. And as it's, it's well known, right, in the community that we need to upgrade and we need to upgrade uh, as regularly as possible. So we cannot just you know, st stop an upgrade saying we are not going to upgrade for an entire year kind of thing. Uh, that is leading to upgrade fatigue because if you deploy it in hundreds of sites across the US in production network and each upgrade takes a few weeks, by the time you finish hundreds of sites, you're actually back to the first site. So the folks supporting it would actually have were, are in a continuous upgrade cycle. And this is, uh, now you know, this is what is causing them not to like uh, CNF, right? So that's where one of the other challenges that come, when they say upgrade, they're kind of hesitant, right? So what really worked in our case, right? If you, if you look based on all the challenges that we faced was actually the fact that the key stakeholders that we interfaced with were actually pushing for the CNFs. And they supported us. It's not so easy unless you have a partner, true partner in crime on the other end, also believing in the same journey, you know, also believing the same path that you want to take. The, the, the advantage we got, uh, we got lucky across multiple operators is that, that the key stakeholders believed in the potential of CNFs, they believed in potential of uh, all the things that we are doing when we take it into containerized network function, and they knew the end goal, and that's what kind of helped drive us through some of these people and process challenges. If not for them, it would not have been so easy for us to actually deliver the uh, CNF, right? I just talked about upgrade fatigue, but upgrade, even though it was painful, and we had to bake it through the different labs, eventually started, worked, right? So we are able to upgrade our CNFs, uh, and what it does is, the more we show the, that upgrade worked, and show the time it took, show like, things like rolling upgrades and all the good features that comes with Kubernetes, it kind of built trust in the folks that are managing it. And that trust is very important to chip away at the upgrade fatigue that they have. Right? That's what kind of helps us uh, push more automation, make more parallelism, and help you know, reduce the upgrade cycles. Uh, obviously, Kubernetes uh, is really good at what it does, and it did help us out in multiple ways. Uh, we had a human error which brought down multiple worker nodes, but the parts moved. The subscribers were not impacted, right? This is just one example. The, this kind of resiliency that is baked into Kubernetes kind of gives us that advantage that was not there before. Because in earlier cases, if something happened and your VM went down, you know, it brought down that entire set of subscribers, then we have to, you know, do, do, we have to get in and physically, manually do things to get it up and running in order to handle. But in our case, the Kubernetes kind of helped us, uh, you know, to make it more resilient. Yeah. And uh, I think the last one for, for me, again, like personally, uh, 
troubleshooting is is is, is painful, but uh, but the tools we had, uh, especially I think uh, I think we're using Victoria Metrics, Prometheus, and and Grafana to collect all the data. And uh, the same problem that took us months to troubleshoot earlier, a year or so ago, this time we could narrow down in a matter of days or weeks, just because we have this uh, monitoring and observability tools. Not only we're we getting the data, but we can manipulate the data on the fly. That I have man, you know, verified CPU load across all the 96 cores. Now I don't have to look at it. Now I can just go towards the mean. Let's just you know, build my own dashboards on the fly. So uh, that was, uh, I think, uh, extremely helpful for us, in, uh, especially when we are doing the load test verification in the labs. Uh, when, you have, when they are trying to push twice as much as subscribers that you're going to typically see, uh, this tool, tooling that we have available really, really helps a lot. And that was not present in the... Uh, the rosy old world. Um, all right. Um, so, call to action. Uh, I think based on the challenges and what work, I think it's very, very clear. Is please invest in your people and processes. I know we all, you know, technology exists, is there, but it has changed. It is different. It's not a question of better or worse. It is different. So the. The people, please. Uh, for example, the operations folks typically are the last to see the technology, but they are the most, you know, they're the main users. They use the technology day in, day out. Uh, you know, people ask me like, why are you taking away my SSH access? It worked, I, I had a very good life. I could print whatever I needed, but you know, here's, here's a different tools. They work differently, they are better. This one is more secure, so on, but please invest them in them as well. Um, and similarly, same thing, I should have talked about processes earlier. Uh, they need to be uplifted along with technology. And uh, building off of the uh, the last comment I had, we are the apps are now heavily dependent on infra. We lose sight of what's happening very quickly. The packet leaves apart, and then you're gone. Right? You don't know. So, fault triage is a challenge. Uh, still, I think even despite all the good stuff we have, uh, and as call to action, if anybody can please help it how to triage a fault that's observed on the application, but is because something happened on the infra. How do we get narrowed down that uh, to the root cause? And yeah, and, and finally, uh, talked a little bit about the upgrade fatigue and, uh, and the reason for upgrading so constantly, right? And that one of the primary reasons is the support. Uh, it's not looked at so often, right? So uh, Kubernetes currently supports 12 months uh, with two months of extended support, and that is not sufficient, not just in telco industry, but I think if you start looking outside as well in finance, healthcare, they cannot afford to have such short upgrades, uh, short, short support periods, right? Which is causing them to upgrade. Therefore, the call to action is to, for the community to start looking at uh, doing a longer term support for Kubernetes, which will help because we don't want to start forking Kubernetes, right? Nobody wants to start forking Kubernetes. We want to contribute back to the community and make sure we follow the community path, right? So that's that's one of the final call to action. And uh, with that, uh, hands our talk, unless. Uh... Yeah. All right. Now we have to thank you so much. And in the meanwhile, if you have to provide any feedback, please scan the QR code. Time for questions, if there are questions. any. It's uh, not a question, it's a comment. There is a Kubernetes LTS working group, so you can join them and help them to have long-term support for Kubernetes. All right, thank you. So call to action already implemented. <laughs> any other questions? Over there. Um, are we actually going the wrong way by doing the long-term support for Kubernetes? I mean, you, you guys talked about how hard it is, the upgrade fatigue and stuff. What we should be doing is improving how we do upgrades so that they're not so manual, so we're not using maintenance windows all the time, so that it can be rolled out easily, and so that upgrades become something that happens without anybody really even noticing, right? Um, I mean, I understand in the short term, uh, the, you can't get there overnight, but but we really need to figure out ways to get to that, right? Correct. Uh, and the reason for asking long-term support, 
there, right, was was to answer some of the questions that you have posed there, right? Exactly with uh, that, we need to get to a place where upgrades happen seamlessly, but that journey is still far away, right? You need to first build trust. You need to the the reason why it's far away uh, is because of for things like regulatory requirements for 911 calls, right? You cannot afford to drop. So what happens if you are doing upgrade? Let's say in off peak hours, right? And there's a 911 call then, right? You have to be careful to handle that. We are looking at things to improve the upgrade, not denying that, but that is still some while away, right? In our, before we can get there, we do need support at the Kubernetes level. And I also want to say one more thing, right? There are two upgrades that we are talking about, right? One is the platform, which is Kubernetes. The second is the applications, right? And both of them are not uh, traveling at the same speed. So th therefore, if, if we get a lot more support at the Kubernetes level, which is giving me a base, then I can start pushing the applications to you know, do more seamless upgrades. That's, that's why this call to action. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much. Awesome, thank you.